We served 25,000 meals this year from August 5th to today, till, till uh, last Saturday. 25,000 meals, that's 50, over 50,000 meals have been served in the past five years or four years and half of them were served just in the past 11 months. Now two things happened to me today I'd like to share related to scripture. We had a Bible study here and uh, a guy came here and he wanted me to go to court with him. And so I went to court with him and he was really concerned. He called me yesterday several times and telling me that he was really concerned and worried. I said, you know, you need to change this concept of worry and to change the word to concern. I says, worry is only causing a problem. And so what I suggest you consider doing, change that word first. And I said, why don't you trust in God? Because you don't have control over what these other people do. You don't have control over the judges. You don't have control over your your probation officer. You don't have control over your uh, case manager. You don't have control over the the, the uh, psychiatrist. You don't have control over anybody. You don't even, you barely have control over yourself. So I said, trust in you. Well, all of these people met in a room with the judge before the court. And he's sitting out there and he's really worried. And so I'm telling him, that you need to focus on God. And he said, would you pray? You know what, if, if I'm gonna pray, I'm not gonna waste my time. I'm believing it's already happened. When I'm praying, it's already happening. It's happening, it's happening. If I'm not, if that's what the Bible says. If I'm gonna pray, it's happening right now. It's happening. It's just so in the scripture, it says whatsoever you desire in the book of uh, ja, uh, Mark, it says, whatsoever he desire, believe that he receive it, and he shall have it. And so I believe when I spend time praying, and we sat there and we prayed together, believing that all these spirits are going to vanish, believing that the Spirit of God was in that courtroom, that something was going to happen in a mighty city. He's afraid he's going to go to jail that day. I said, it's not going to happen. He's going to get a new freedom. He's going to get a new understanding. The court judge is going to change the orders. Things are going to happen. When you believe and you pray, things happen. That's what the Bible promises us. Now, if this is the word of God, then we got to believe that that's what's happening. And so I believe if I'm going to spend time with, to pray with someone, it happens. I can tell you years ago, I prayed for a lady, she had cancer. And so we sat down and we prayed and I started seeing these cancer cells being cured in front of my eyes. And I'm saying, you're cured, the process is happening. It's happening right now. And you know what, she went back to the doctors two weeks later and they could not find us any sign of, of uh, cancer. Now I don't go around telling people that I'm a, a Benny Hinn. I don't go around telling people that I have this gift of uh, prayer, the, this gift of healing. But you know, I believe that what this Bible says, that all of us have the same power. And it's, he, that's what Jesus did. And so each of us have that power. But see, you have to believe in your mind, it's happening. It's happening right now. And so when I start praying, and I believe these things are happening. I've seen kidney, kidneys being healed in my mind. And it does happen. I've seen all kinds of miracles happen over the years. I don't go around telling people this, but if you ask me for prayer and I'm praying with you, I can assure you that I'm already seeing it happening. And today, as we were in that courthouse and we're praying for this guy, the judge comes in, everybody stands up, the judge comes in and he starts talking love. He starts talking about how wonderful this guy's becoming, how the good things that are occurring. Yeah, he may have violated a few issues here and there, but he sees a new, a new person here today. And so he says, I'm gonna give you a chance. Another three and a half weeks, I'll give you out on the street, we'll come back and see how you're doing. He's in a new home, he's married. He's a whole new situation is occurring. And so he's believing that maybe it's time for a change. Maybe he's paid enough price in society for the errors he's made in the past. Maybe there's a new beginning. And so that's the vision I saw at the time we were praying. And it happened, it happened. And so I'm not gonna waste my time praying unless it's happening, it's happening now, it's happening right now. And so if you can believe that and start praying that you're gonna be removed off these streets in 2007, it's already happening. You may not see it right now, but it's happening, it's happening. 
believe that it's happening right now if you're going to believe. And I shared this with uh, Phil. And he's in room 504 in the hospital. And so I have another message to share. He said he was touched by that message. He says, boy, I, you've given me new words to give me a new excitement. He says, I'm getting goosebumps. It's happening. It's happening. That's the words when you're praying. And he says he's going to share that with other people today. And then in addition, I went, while I was there with Phil, I was telling him about some stories. I was telling him about the times I go around and I see, I saw myself a, several years ago going around to coffins. And I had this double-edged sword with me. It's a Bible. It says Bible, Holy Bible. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And so I'm carrying this book with me at all times, in my pocket at all times. When I, you don't see me with a Bible, it's in my pocket at all times. Why? Why? Because it works. Because it works. And because, as I go around, I see a lot of people living in coffins. I saw myself living in a coffin. And somebody came around and took that double-edged sword, the Holy Bible, and started cracking over the top of that box. And I started pushing it open because somebody was showing me some light. And so as I saw this light, it became brighter. And yeah, it was tough for me to see at first. It was tough for me to understand what am I going this route for. But I started seeing a light that I started liking. And pretty soon, you see what I'm doing today. And so now, the Lord is telling me that I'm supposed to be going around with my double-edged sword, trying to pry off the coffins that so many of us live in. We've been trained in this physical world in such a way that greed is all important. That it's so important, money, it's all about money. It's all about this natural stuff. There's nothing in this, this spiritual world that is real. But you know, that's what the world teaches us. But the Bible teaches us, it's all about the spiritual realm. It's all about the spiritual realm. It's all about the things unseen. And so, why are they unseen? Because you don't have the light. And so I go around trying to pry open boxes to try to give people an opportunity to see some light. But you know, I found there's a lot of people, as you see, there's about 20 people that usually listen to this message. And then all of a sudden when we get a line, we have 60 people or 80 people standing in line. Because there's only a few people that want the light. People are so wrapped up in their boxes, they see this darkness, they're so accustomed to the darkness, when the, I try to lift open that box to give them a little bit of light, it hurts their eyes, I don't want it. So what they've done, they've screwed handles underneath in their box and holding it down tight. So every time I go around to try to pry open that box, they're holding it down. They like living in the darkness. They like living this lie that they've been taught. That's the, they don't want no change. You know, the Bible says, I've taught it last week, you need to be transformed if you want a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so people don't want to be transformed. They like living in the darkness. And so the message here is in the Bible, I think it's Mark, give me a scripture, uh, St. John, 1 John, we got a light all over this Bible. I think in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, will tell you about the difference in light and darkness. And I don't trust my own words, so I go to the scripture. And it says here, living in the light, this is a message we heard from Jesus and now declares to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go into living in the spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so, the message here is twofold. If you're gonna believe that prayer works, then believe it's happening, it's already happening. And number two, is if you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, stop pushing the box down. Start allow it. Start pushing it open. Start getting a little more. And the only way you'll get a little more is from those books that are on that table over there that happens to say the Holy Bible. But you know what? It's not the words on that book. The, those words are the Word of God. They're the truth. He shall know the truth, 
and the truth shall set you free. I'm not telling you my words. I'm telling you words that are practical application. This is, I'm a pragmatic kind of guy. You know, the uncivilized world tells us that uh, the uncivilized world tells us there is uh, uh, those people that were Indians, those people that are uh, that were uh, Eskimos, those people that were tribes in uh, in Africa, those people Aborigines. You know, our society took care of those homeless. There was no homeless there, and here we're in this so-called quote civilized unquote society and we see homelessness all over something's wrong in this world something's wrong what are we doing about it why are we allowing this homeless condition in ourselves why aren't we doing anything to try to change it we have a part to to make a difference in our world too first we have to have the light that's what god is showing me once we get this light we can grow upon it and so I want to thank you for those of you that are here that are listening to this word, that don't come here just, just to give me, give me, give me food, but you were interested in hearing a few words that I say. Or even if you're coming here just out of respect, thank you so much. And so if I could have someone here say a little prayer of thanksgiving, you want me to stand please. Up? All right. Let's pop. Realize. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we must have to give you thanks for everything. Most of all is our life, that we must give you the best, blessed for you, the Heavenly Father. Everything that we receive from you, we know every good thing is from you, Father. In the name of Jesus, forgive us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, each one of you, for coming down here. And if not, not to hear my words, but even out of respect for me. Thank you. But I pray that I might say some words that might have a significant impact on just at least one of you. Yesterday we were talking about it's time for a change. And today the Lord seems to, I was spent some time with another pastor. We spent several hours together. And see, he's starting to, he's been playing out in the ball field someplace or in the bandstand, not doing anything for years. Now, years ago, he and I used to do stuff together. He invited me as his assistant pastor many years ago. And we used to do stuff. And we were in the game doing stuff together. And so, four years ago, God told me, wake up! And he said, it's time for a change. He said, jump out of the water like Peter did and come follow me. And so I've been trying to keep my eyes on Jesus. And my desire is not to be a pastor. My desire isn't to be a cook. My desire isn't to, to serve the hungry and the homeless. But you know what? My desire is only to be a disciple of Christ. But well, what did Jesus do? He fed 5,000 people one time. That's just the men plus the women and children. He fed 4,000 people a couple of weeks later. And so those are things that Jesus did. What are we doing to make a difference? Well, many of us are sitting on a bandstand. That's like me. I was at a ballpark, a ball game, sitting in the bandstand, watching the baseball or the football game, doing nothing, just watching other people do the work. Well, I'm inviting every one of you to take a chance, take a risk, walk out of that boat, start doing something, be part of the game, be one of the team members, even if you want to be in the background. You know, we still need a bat boy. We still need somebody to bring the water. We need somebody to do a lot of stuff that's behind the scene. And so I'm not asking you to come up here and share the word of God. I'm not coming up here asking you to come cook some food. I'm not asking you to do anything except what the Lord tells you to do. And I don't know what that is, but we each have a message, message a mission. Now I know that Alan didn't know, uh, I mean, uh, um, Earl over here, he was doing this, feeding the hungry, because that's what the Lord was telling him. And he told me, he said he saw me pulling that wagon, he tried pulling it, and he knew that he had to, he had to help. And so, I don't know what to each one of your message, but he pulled the wagon. How many of you have pulled the wagon? It's a real simple job. You know, I'm almost 61 years old, and I've been pulling this wagon for four years, six days a week. I'm look, I, one day I was walking here, all the way from the, the uh, he saw me at the, at the garage, two miles away, a 29 year old guy and he walked me twice he walked with me all the way the Lord was telling me don't don't ask him 
let my spirit wake up in him. And obviously his spirit hasn't waken up in him. He walked all the way two miles. Well, this 61-year-old guy is pulling 250 pounds all the way here as he's walking next to me. One day, just a few months ago, Maka over here was pulling the wagon by herself. And a man's walking right next to her. And finally she says, why don't you pull this wagon? Now, when do, why does he ask to, why does she have to tell another man, Here's a, this lady is so thin and frail, and she's pulling 200 pounds of food. Now, she took an action. She took, made a decision to do something differently than she's ever done before. And so I'm just inviting you to do something like you. Maybe you've never done before. Get out of the boat like, you know, like Peter did. Take a chance. You know, maybe it's not an easy job. But you know what? Doing something for the Lord is better than nothing. Even if it's the wrong direction, like I said yesterday, even if it's in the wrong direction, inertia, it's easier to change inertia once you've got it going than be able to start the process. To get that ball first moving is really difficult. But you know, once it's moving, you can go in the opposite direction and then you can knock it out of the ball field. You can be out in the bandstand and catch it. But see, I'm inviting each one of you to come out of the bandstand, get into the field. This is a real easy ministry. It's not me. This isn't my ministry. I, God is, I didn't even name it. Another, the guy I was with today named it. So this isn't my, I just happen to be a steward of it. And I'm inviting each of you to come step forward. Just pull the wagon. Watch what happens. Every person that's pulled this wagon, something different, spectacular happened in their lives. They've gotten jobs. They've joined the army. It's significant. They've accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Miracles have happened in everybody's life that has happened. There was one guy that pulled the wagon just, he hated it for five days. And you know, he lived free for two months. He had all new clothes. He had money in his pocket every day. And then he decided to go back to the booze. People gave him money left and right and did things for him just because he was walking with me because he happened to know me. And so the people that know, knew me tried to help him. And he turned his back on him. Now, I suggest to you and I invite each one of you, do something and I just pull the wagon, if nothing else. Help here, Daniel. He's been telling people for a long time, come help Bob, come help Bob. Today, he said, I'm telling people to help him and I've never helped him. So he decided to take the effort today, and he helped me today. He helped prepare the soup. And so miracles can happen once you start doing something. Make a habit of doing something for other people. Don't keep thinking about yourself. You know, when I was out here homeless, all I cared about was myself. Now, as I think about other people, God takes care of all my needs. He's going to take care of all your needs. And so I guess that's the message today. And in the book of... The book of uh, Reminded me in, in Ruth. Ruth was a lady. She was a lady that uh, was married to a Jew. She was, she was a Gentile living in Jordan. And uh, she married a, a Jew. And they moved back to Jordan, where it was called Jordan now. And her husband died. And she was with her mother. And her mother said, I'm going back to, the, uh, uh, to my country, to, to my land, because she was a Jew. She's going back there because her husband owned some property. She said, I'm going back there, even though they had no house or anything there. And, she, and the, her mo the one daughter left. But that daughter, Ruth, decided to stay with her. She says, I'm going to do what my husband wanted me to do. I'm going to stay with you. Whatever you want, I'm going to accept the same Lord that you accept. And so she started following her. And so it, because she went back to Israel and she started gleaning, which means that she started getting food See, in, in, the, in, the Isra in the Israeli time, 2,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago, they used to uh, take, take the edges of the, of the farms. The farm, farmers allowed the people, the poor people, to take the edges, the stuff around the edges of their farm. And that's called gleaning. And so she used to glean off of property. Well, this particular day, she went to this uh, guy by the name of Boaz, which was the great, great, great grandfather of, uh, of Jesus. What I'm sharing here is just what the Lord is leading me to say. I had no idea I was going to share this stuff. You know, the Holy Spirit can work in people in awesome ways. You know, before I came here, I used to spend six hours studying before I would stand in front of people to share about the Word of God. Before I would have a Bible study, I would spend six hours. Today, I don't do that. Today, I don't remember where the book of Jud Ruth is. 
There it is. He says, Boaz went over to Ruth and listen, my daughter, stay right here with us and gather grain. Don't do it in other fields. He's telling her now, stay with me. Stay right behind the young women working my field. See which part of the field they are harvest, harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself the water they have drawn from the well. So he's saying, hey, because they are harvesting, I'm, I'm out there harvesting with this wagon. Come with me. Like Boaz is telling Ruth, come with me. Harvest with me. Harvest with those that are around me. And follow, in this case, follow them. Well, I'm going to suggest you follow me, not because of Bob Earp, but because Christ might be in me. And then he says, And, and when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. And you know what? Every volunteer that has worked with me have free access to all the food they want to eat. They have free access to all the drink they want to drink. Now, as you know, that sometimes I get kind of rough to remind you, this ain't a restaurant. <laughs> because the volunteers can eat whatever they want. They can pick and choose anything they want. But I don't have time to allow people that just want to eat, take, take, take. Do something. Do something. I'm just looking at it. You can take, take, take all you want. I'll keep giving it to you. The youth down on the wall for six months wouldn't take anything from me. Once they finally figured, because they don't they don't let OGs do anything. They don't trust OGs, us old guys. But after six months, they, I said, go ahead, take some. They ended up emptying on my wagon. Time after time after, I kept on reminding me, there's more people I could serve if you don't, if you leave a little bit. After a while, they after they kept on doing it, they got the picture, I was gonna keep coming back. And so they started leaving a little bit for me. And now, just a few months ago, I was down at the wall and, and they said, told me, they says, you know, we've never seen anybody in our life that was ever freely gave stuff without any condition. And it was kind of difficult. You know, they're, they're living in a house that they're taught, give me something and I'll give you something in return. And see, I don't, I say just take, take, take. Now this is a new way to live. And I want to show you how, what worked for me. I'm not telling you any kind of, I'm not going to tell you no hocus pocus religious stuff. I'm going to tell you stuff that works for me. I'm an engineer. I, I'm an exact kind of guy. I want to see what really works. I want to see the evidence of what works. And, and as there's a few people here that knew me, saw me a bit today. And you know what? I'll bet you a year from now, I'm going to be more different today. And so I want to thank those of you that are here that are within my hearing range and have a desire to hear what I was coming out of my mouth. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for the, just be the respect that you're giving me. And I want to thank those that do volunteer at times. So if, uh, thank you for allowing me to share that message. I got, I'm sure I got more tomorrow. Keep coming back, six o'clock every day. And so I'd like somebody to share a prayer. Hey brother, what's your name? You. Sterling. What is it? Sterling. Sterling. Like Sterling. The car. Sterling. Yeah, Sterling. 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 Could you say a prayer for us? A prayer of thanksgiving for the food? Sure. Most wonderful, great spirit, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to receive all your blessings. Uh, we pray that your will be done. We pray that things go in a direction that will allow this to uh, spread and grow and reach more people. Uh, we pray that through the meetings that uh, positive events can outcome, can uh, come from those experiences and pray that the spirits of Maka uh, can be eliminated and that uh, she can grow and we can expand and uh, I pray for your blessings uh, upon the provider of this food and that we can continue to grow and be strong and we pray to offer our lives to you always and forever in uh, Christ's name we pray these things amen, amen. 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 Thank you. Right. we got some mustard seed I wanted you each to see what a mustard seed is does anyone that doesn't have a mustard seed? I have a, I have a handful of them here. I just wanted you to see how small these mustard seeds are. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. And by the way, they're good to eat. If you so desire. Because something magnificent could happen with that mustard seed. Yesterday we were talking about getting out of the bandstand 
and getting down in the field and doing something. Sometimes getting down in the field and plant, doing something is planting some seeds. Yesterday we talked about, about uh, Ruth going behind the, uh, the people who were harvesting, picking up the, uh, the wheat behind Boaz's uh, crew and that he would provide her water and he, she could take this, this wheat and food that she was collecting and keep it. Now it took some time for that wheat to grow up. Well, these mustard seeds grow into a tree. How small these tiny seeds are. And it grows into a, a tree like this one over here. Now just imagine how tiny that is. Now you've seen seeds plant, you know, you've seen nuts. Nuts are ten, tends to be seeds of trees. They're a lot bigger than that mustard seed. And Jesus talked about it in several places. Let me talk about it one way here. He says in Mark, chapter 4, verse 30, Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, he says it two places. I'm going to read them both. In Mark, he says, Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? Now, Jesus went around to teach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we have to suffer a little bit because repenting doesn't feel good. Because you've got to change your ways. We've been talking about changing our ways. You know, hopefully we'll be in a motion, some kind of motion. Yesterday we were talking about being in a motion and the day before, and it's easier to be in motion. You can easily change your direction when you're in motion. So as you're, as you're, uh, as you're in motion now, you can start doing something. And one of those things is planting seeds. And Jesus says, how can I describe the kingdom of God? Now, once you get beyond that point of repenting, now you, what, what's the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of this, all seeds for trees. But it becomes the largest of all the garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can grow nests in its shade. Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as such as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterwards, when he, he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. Now, he says almost the same thing. Because remember, these are just basically the stories of different people writing the same thing. He says in Matthew, Matthew, uh, 13 verse 31 he says again he says here's another illustration Jesus used the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field it is the smallest of all seeds but it becomes the largest of garden plants it grows into a tree and birds come and make nests into its branches now you got to keep in mind this mustard seed also produces some kind of fruit now it takes a while for fruit to grow those nuts, on those nut trees, close, takes a while to grow. Does that look like her? It looks like this guy sitting down, a nut. What, I look like a nut? You know, all of a sudden, now as she's doing this, all of a sudden another thought comes into my mind. I see how, this is kind of veering off the mustard seed for a moment, but as I see these, this bubble, our life is like a bubble. And it's so fragile because we're thinking about me, 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 me. And you know, as soon as those, as soon as those bubbles start touching each other, watch what happens. And when they touch each other, or touch something, they bombard each other. It goes, it tears apart. Because see, it can't survive when it's with me, me, me. When it's just I, myself, and 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 me, it doesn't last very long. See, look at them falling apart. As soon as they touch something, they they disappear. And you know, our lives are like that. As we move around from place to place, as our lives touch each other, we can easily touch each other and, do, and ruin their lives, each other's lives. Punching them out, creating problems in their lives. Because we're so focused on me. And so, I'm just suggesting to you, 
this is veering off the mustard seed idea, but... <laughs> They're both, they're both spheres, though. They're both spheres. They're both round, anyway. <laughs> I mean, thank you for the correlation. I'm looking for something to tie it together. They're both round. So, anyways, when you start thinking about us now, it becomes stronger. Now, this, this bubble is not a very good example of us. It's only a good example. Well, you did see a couple of them do, were together. But how fragile we are when we think just about ourselves. And so I'm just going to suggest to you, start thinking about other people. When you're planting that mustard seed, you're planting it for, for some fruit for later on for other people. It's usually not just for yourself. You're going to share that. Well, there's a lot of people that want to do it just for themselves. But the point is you've got plenty that you could share. And see, as you, you might be that seed itself. And you know, you might become something much more greater than you are today. So as tiny as that mustard seed is, you might become something awesome. Yeah. And so it may take time. It may take time. Because, like I said, those nuts on the trees, and some of them on the ground here, <laughs> eventually they get roots, rooted when there's enough, when there's enough uh, water. When there's enough water, they get rooted and they get roots, and if they can draw upon that spring of water under the ground, or what we call in the spiritual realm, the spirit of, of the, the spirit itself, water being the spirit, if you can draw upon the spirit, you can grow into something phenomenal. And so that's the next step of what the mustard seed, Jesus talked about the mustard seed again. He says, do you have enough faith? Do you have enough faith? Well, if you don't have enough faith, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could do the, you could say to this mountain right over here, Diamond Head, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Nothing would be impossible. If you have as small as that mustard seed you have, nothing is impossible. If you can have faith that much, see faith, here it is, that little mustard seed something's going to happen to that thing. Now, you just look at that mustard seed, it looks like that's all you got. If you look in the scientific world, that's all you got. But you know, something else is going to happen. If you have faith that that thing is going to grow and that something's going to happen, it's going to bear fruit and it's going to provide you something for the future, a spice if nothing else. And see how it doesn't exist, does it? But you know, the, the faith is, faith is, what's the word? The exact words in the King James? Evidence. Faith is the evidence of things not evidence seen. Evidence of the things. Not uh, seen in the, the no. substance of things hoped for. The substance. The substance. Of substance of, no, it's the. Things not seen in the evidence of things not hoped for. Yeah. Substance of hope. The substance of, of hope. Not seen in the evidence, evidence of things hoped for. Of things unseen. I think it's the other way. No, it's, it's but anyway, it doesn't make any difference. You, you can't see this mustard tree in that little oh, seed. But you know, it happens. It happens. And see, if you have a little bit of faith that you're going to have some kind of dream fulfilled, as we talked about yesterday, if you have a little bit of faith that that dream might come true, and you get in the field and start doing something, not stay in the bandstand and watching other people, but get in the field and start doing something, eventually that seed is going to grow into a tree. Eventually, when you get that another another uh, mustard seed from that, you can move mountains. And you know what? We move mountains today. We have big these big equipment now moving mountains. We're gonna move move the Hennerman out of the office. But you know, sometimes moving mountains is just small things, like getting the permits for s over six months, seven months, eight months. I've been trying to get permits for to operate inside that snack shop to use the electrical power for eight months and nobody wants to help me. And so I've been going to place after place from a mayor to city councilmen to the directors of the place. And we're meeting here, including the owner, we're meeting in City Hall Wednesday. And I'd like to keep your thoughts and your prayers on Wednesday at three o'clock. I'm gonna be meeting with several of the other people and I'm gonna have someone that'll help me to be humble because sometimes I can be kind of... I think you need to be humble. Aggressive. So I ask for your prayers and thoughts to be considered this mountain that I've been trying to move. A simple little, a simple little uh, 
permit sometimes can be a mountain. I need four permits. I wonder how many I'm going to walk away with. I, you know, a miracle, we could have all four of them. But well, we'll see. If we get one, that's a small mountain because it's taken so long. And so, the emphasis here is keep your faith, build faith, have a vision of the future as we talked about yesterday. And then instead of doing the same thing you've been doing, start doing something different. Get yourself an emotion, even if it's the wrong way, get yourself an emotion. And you know what? If you realize it's the wrong direction, it's much easier to revert your direction than to continue in the same, than uh, to try to start from nothing. You know, to, to get, there's a lot of people here that five years ago when I was here, they were homeless. There's two, there's two dozen people still on the beach that are still homeless because they, it's so hard to get the motion to get something going, to get yourself off the street. You're so accustomed to it. And so I think that God is telling me it's my job to try to inspire you. Do something, do something, anything. And I'm giving you all kinds of opportunities to do something. And if the, I'm try, I'm doing the best I can. And I'm not, I'm just a homeless guy just like you guys. I just happen to be blessed. As I think of the needs of other people, God is taking care of me. He's putting a roof over my head. And also, uh, four years ago, before I started this ministry, I was 130 pounds. And somehow, by some kind of miracle, I got 172 pounds. And it wasn't because I was looking for food. Well, maybe I was looking for food, but I was giving it away. The more I gave away, the more I got. And the more I try to help other people get off the street, other people let me sleep in their tool shed. They let me sleep in their garage. They let me sleep in the floor of their house. They just let me sleep on their couch. And that's where I'm at now. And so that gives me enough money to keep buying food, to keep this, keep this action, keep moving, keep moving. If you, if you want you to start something, keep moving. You know, if I'm going in the wrong direction, then I can switch. But you know, I'm gonna keep moving. I'm thinking I'm still supposed to be underneath that roof there. You know, there's so many times on the weekend I look for a, a table and I can't find a table. And there's 18 tables underneath that, that roof that I can't use yet. Because I don't have a permit. Because somebody else is renting that building from the city and county that the people of the county of the state of Hawaii paid for. And I can't use it because we're, obviously, we attract too many pigeons, I guess whatever so we have an interesting experience ahead of us the whole mustard seed deal is it's so small you can't even see it when I hold it like this from there can you that's that's how small it is but it says there's another passage that says God has given to every man a measure of faith every man has a measure of faith and he says all you need is this much to move the mountain right so how do we get this faith business we need faith, right? The scripture says what? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you need to get the word of God in you to get more of this faith, the more of it you got, because it says whatsoever is not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Okay, so we need to have a little bit more faith because God's gonna tell us with that faith what it is we're supposed to be doing, what it is we're not. And then the other thing is that I think it's in Romans 14. One more passage about faith that's really important. It says, uh, yeah, that's the one. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. There was Hebrews 11. That was this one. The one he brought up. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So God gave you a little bit of evidence of the invisibility of, of reality, right? Because God is real, but he's invisible. He gave you a little bit of evidence. So when you don't, believe that evidence you're not using your faith right and what was the other one the faith chapter the faith chapter chapter 11 of hebrews here it is verse 6 without faith it is impossible to please him right for him that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, faith is one of the most important keys and tools of the deal. Because the whole armor of God, it says that it's our defense. It says, the shield of faith wherewith ye shall quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 
Okay, so when the devil's throwing darts at you, yeah. all you need is that measure of faith that God has given to every man to be your shield, and then you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. But yeah, that, that faith chapter is really cool. And so I'm just going to give you the last verse of it because uh, everybody likes that Hebrews chapter 11. But the last verse of it is the coolest part because it says that the whole crew that it mentions in the whole chapter 11 Hebrews, right, when it talks about Abraham and all his faith that he had and Isaac, Jacob, Samson, Isaiah, it mentions all the Bible heroes in that whole chapter or most of them, right? And then in the last verse, it says, God having provided something better thing for some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. So they need us to achieve perfection. So, by all means, use your faith. You want some prayer? I'm gonna say a little prayer. I'm gonna put this little mustard seed away for future reference. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for uh, putting a smile on our hearts. Thank you for smiling at us. Lifting your countenance upon us makes our day a whole lot better than it was without such a, a smile from you. And we just want to thank you for all the things that we forgot to thank you for, like the beautiful uh, fresh tasting air and the beautiful friendships that we share and you know, the beautiful parking stalls we found and whatever it is that you know we think is mundane, you gave it to us. All good gifts come from above. So we just want to thank you for every single thing that we forgot to thank you for in times past. And uh, we just want to thank you again for the food, blessing for our health and uh, nourishment. And Lord, we just, we just love you as little children. We're your children. We just thank you for in inviting us to be part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God is good, good is great, and we thank God for those deeds. By those hands we shall be fed. God is good, good is great, never have to be the dead. It's the best you have in your head. God is good, good is great, I'll see you sooner. seed that you couldn't even see from from the distance from where you're at now and to where I'm at 
that grows into a, to a big bush as big as a tree, as big as this tree over here, and it grows fruit. And so today I want to talk a little bit about the fruit. In addition, I got these bowls that I want to add a little bit. Not only the fruit, there's nine fruit that we can gain as we mature with God working on our life. In addition, there's a, nine blessings. It's in the Beatitudes. So I'm going to combine the two a little bit, only because I have these uh, these things that maybe that maybe I can give away for those people that need a little bit of joy, love, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control. And so that might help you to remember stuff. And so, how do I link yesterday's concern about a mustard seed? Well, in the book of Galatians, we've talked about this before. In the book of Galatians, it talks about nine different gifts of the Spirit. As you get a relationship with God, He gives you these gifts of the Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He will produce the kind of fruits in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no conflict with the law. And so you, as we take that seed of a mustard seed, that faith of a mustard seed, and begin to use it in our life, it can grow and eventually over a period of time, you begin to, people begin to see the fruit that, of your life. You get a sense of love and a joy and a peace, a comfort, a gentleness, a kindness, self-control. You're able to stop a lot of your addictive problems, able to stop drinking, able to stop using drugs, able to stop smoking, able to stop womanizing, able to stop doing a lot of things that you couldn't do with yourself when you have God on your side. And so, those that you notice the first is a sense of love, joy, and peace. And so, I want to talk about those. How do they link to the Beatitudes? Well, because I got these cups and somebody wrote, wrote these Beatitudes on these cups. There happen to be nine Beatitudes. So let's link these nine beatitudes with the nine gifts of the, the fruit, the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Well, what are they? Well, I did this one study se several years ago on blessed are the poor. And I wrote a big dissertation about it. But rather than talk about the big dissertation, I want to talk about just how different scripture, different interpretations, of, there's like 37 English interpreters of, of, of the Bible that I tend to review. 37, and I picked about seven of them here to help you see what just this one beatitude is. Blessed are the poor. And in the King, New King James that are on the table there, it's in, ch in chapter 5 of uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we read it in other, uh, other Bibles, we might be able to understand it a little more clear. In the message, it says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and His rule. We've talked about this. That because we are poor, we have an opportunity to get closer to God than we could if we're rich. We don't have all these obstacles. We don't have these things that hinder us from having this relationship with God. And so, that's what this is saying in the message. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is much more of God and His rule. He can rule you more effectively when you don't have a house to worry about and a car to worry about and children to worry about and neighbors to be concerned about. You can now focus your attention on God. So you got a wonderful opportunity here. You can keep dwelling in your, 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 uh, uh, your pain and agony, your despair that you're feeling, or you can start looking at something good about what's happening because everything is bad. To every adversity, there's a seed, as we talked about yesterday, the seed of greater benefit. That mustard seed, it can give you a greater benefit. This opportunity to be homeless can be the seed of something much greater than what you could ever imagine right now. And I'll tell you, four years ago, I could never imagine that I'd be out here preaching the Word of God and feeding 50,000 meals. I'm not a cook, and I'm not, I wasn't trained as a preacher, and I wasn't trained as a cook. 
but you know, I probably qualify as a cook after 50,000 meals, and I probably qualify as a preacher after thousands of, of messages like I've shared. So it's not about training, it's about doing something different. Now let's look at another, another version, the Amplified Bible. It says, blessed, they describe what that blessed means in the Amplified Bible, happy to be happy, to be envied, and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of the outward condition. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor in spirit? The humble who rate themselves insignificant. And sometimes we rate ourselves in, insignificant. At least other people sure do. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what the Amplified Bible says. See, I'm, I'm not even giving you commentary. I'm just telling you different interpretations, English interpretations of the Hebrew or the Greek. And so, another one is the New International Reader's Version. Blessed are those who are spiritually needy. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Again, blessed are the poor. This is a, blessed are those who are spiritually needy. See, there's some similarity. Here's, here's the Wycliffe New Testament. Blessed be poor men in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is there. Now, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven. What is it? We could talk about it again maybe tomorrow. Or no, I won't be here tomorrow, Friday. In the contemporary English version, this is really clear. If you don't understand those other versions, this should be really clear. God bless you when people insult you, mistreat you, and tell you all kinds of evil lies about you because of me. Be happy and excited. You will have a great reward in heaven. People did the same thing to the prophets who lived long ago. Uh, I'd say that's pretty much of a commentary in itself, what that uh, contemporary English version is. And then one of my favorite is the New Living Translation. He says, God bless you when you, you are mocked and persecuted and lied about because when you were in my followers, be happy about it. Be very glad for a great re reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted too. And so one of the things that we can, we can get, number one, because we're out poor, we can humble ourselves much more effectively than most people that are rich. Number two, pride gets in our way most of the time. I mean, some of us, myself, and I know George and myself, deal with pride a lot. We have difficulty overcoming. We, we, he lived 63 years thinking he's the greatest man in the world, and I lived 61 years thinking I was the greatest, well, 56 years ago, I started realizing I'm not so great. I, I started wising up the past four years. <laughs> there's a lot, of, a lot of Bible preachers who always bust out this scripture because there's a promise in here. And like last week or two weeks ago, I was talking about the promises of God. And so this is one promise that I want you to take to heart, okay? Because there's, everybody's going through something that sucks at one point or another and it's like oh this is my circumstances it sucks okay and so when you're in this type of circumstance I want you to grab onto this promise and hold on for dear life because this is a promise from God and it's uh, Psalms 30 verse 5 what it says is that for his anger endureth but a moment in his favor is life weeping may endure for a night but joy cometh in the morning, okay? So whatever it is you're going through that sucks, just remember, weeping endures for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So take that promise from God into your heart. It says, thy words have I hid in mine heart so that I might not sin against thee. Take that word of God and bank on it because the word of God is true. true. It says every word of God is pure, my favorite one is in Romans, it says, uh, chapter 3, Romans chapter 3 here, first part of verse 4, it says, let God be true, but every man a liar, okay, so don't believe just something because I told it to you, believe it because you read it in the word of God, okay, let God be true, and every man a liar, so that's my word for you. Weeping endures for a night, joy comes in the morning. Everybody thank God, say, God help us, indeed. And so we just want to thank you, Lord, for this blessing of the food and the fellowship. 
and the Brotherhood and Waikiki Beach Outreach Ministry. And we just want to ask you, Lord, to increase our faith. We want to ask you to help us be the people you want us to be and give us compassion towards other people. Give us forgiveness towards other people and let us not forget people on the other side of the world who are dying in your name. In Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And on the bottom of this one says joy. Now, we've been talking about the poor. Is there anybody here that needs a little bit of joy? Would anybody like a little bit of joy? I'm trying to give these away because I've had these in my in my uh, my uh, Bob, garage. Would you like some joy? Yeah. Thank you. Many blessings. God bless you. Now, the second. Are you wearing it as a hat? Uh, I'm Domica. Oh, very good. I like that. I like that. Now you get no meal. You get the joy. No meal. <laughs> now, the second one is blessed. Are they that mourn? for they shall be comforted. And on the bottom of this one is love. Is there anybody that like a little bit of love, that needs a little bit more of love? Please, I need to give these away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Number three, the nine Beatitudes. We're at three. And the nine virtues, or the nine gifts of the Spirit or the nine fruits of the Spirit. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, meekness. Anybody want some meekness? Maybe you? <laughs> yeah, I could, I could probably oh. use a lot, a lot of meekness. Maybe I ought to keep this one up. Oh, here's a guy. That's the word on my head? No, Oh, but you can. He just likes it on his head. Huh? <laughs> Number four, the fourth one. Blessed are the... <laughs> are they who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I think, I think because God has put me around here, I think you've been kind of blessed. I think you've been probably, your hunger pain has probably disappeared. You probably don't have a lot of thirst. And on the bottom of that is faith. I love you, Bob. I love you too, Robert. So he's walking away with faith. Faith, like that mustard seed, faith. He's growing. The se Sarah's a 70, 72 year old man from Hawaii, and he's still homeless. No, none of our community wants to help the 72 year old man that's a Hawaiian born, and nobody wants to help him. Hmm. You know, uncivilized countries, you know, like uh, the Indians and the Eskimos, the, the community tended to take care of. There was no homelessness, but not in the United States, the quote, civilized country. Anyways, that's what I reminded every time I see Robert. Number five, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, would anybody like a little bit of gentleness? Now, that's what I need the most. You gonna wear it? <laughs> I think I need, need to keep that one. Would anybody else care to have it? I really gotta disappear. <laughs> anybody like some gentleness? See, this fruit, this fruit hasn't grown upon me yet. But I believe in time, even gentleness is gonna grow want to be one of the fruits that, that I possess because God has promised all of these fruits to each one of us. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. As you gain, a, as we gain a, 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 bless, a more pure heart, the blessings are coming our way. And with that comes goodness. Does anybody want some goodness? I'll take peace. You'll take what? Peace, I already get, gave that one away. Goodness. I'm already good. Enough. Goodness. Somebody wants some goodness. Maybe you could trade goodness for peace. I'll trade goodness for peace any day. Take it and trade it. I'm already good. Oh, this is another one I probably need. Kindness. One of the fruits of, uh, of the Spirit is kindness. Is there anybody here want a little bit more kindness? I know that Barbara has a lot of kindness. Thank you. You're already gay. How can you get any kinder? Oh. <laughs> the next blessing is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be children of God. And so, does anybody want a little peace? And I don't mean, I mean peacefulness. Whoa. I 
Yeah. Does anybody want a little piece? I want it. I go old. His heart is in the right place. I'm sorry. My, maybe it's not his mind. Well. Bobby, you need some peace? Yeah, this is a peace symbol. You're the kind of guy that probably wore it around your neck back in those days, didn't you? <laughs> Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that's in Matthew 5, the, the Bible in Matthew 5, chapter 5, the Beatitudes of the nine Beatitudes. The nine fruits of the spirits is in Galatians chapter 5 also, I believe. And the next one is temperance. Does anybody need some temperance? Some calmness, some quietness. Does anybody like need a little bit of temperance? I need to give this bowl to somebody. Temporary killer one. Now this guy here, I gotta, I gotta bring some attention to this guy here. I've known this guy for four years now. He was 11 years old when he came on the beach. I think he's 14 now. He's 14 now. And you know, here's a guy nobody really cares about. But you know, I, he knows I care about him. I care about all the guys he hangs out with. And so what a blessing that he's here. There's another lady here that's been helping him. She's been on the beach since she was 13. She's 22 now. And nobody cares about her, but she knows I do. So does anybody would like some self-control? I think Mike over here, he's a good man. He's already got a lot of self-control. My wife doesn't see all the time. <laughs> well, that's why we're giving you a little bit more. And now, lastly, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so those of us that are homeless here, we've got a lot of persecution. Most of us have had tickets. Most of us have had fights with people. So let's make those fights, let's make those fights with people more because we love Jesus Christ. More because it's about protecting ourselves, defending our. There's only one out of all of the gifts of, of all of the armor that we can have in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, it says the only offensive weapon we have is the Word of God. The Word of God is the Bible. And so, this is the only offensive. The other things is defense. So if you get in a fight, hopefully it's just defense. And so, I know for four years, you too, for four years, we've had a lot of long suffering. Now, does anybody want some long suffering as a remembrance because it's beginning to change? I'll take it. <laughs> and this is patience. Does anybody need some patience? I think I think uh, I think George over here needs the most patience. I'm so patient that I get sick of being patient. You, you need it? Oh, <laughs> Barbara needs says she needs the patience. Boy, do I need patience. See, if he's not ready to admit it, then there's nothing we can do. The object of giving this stuff away is just to help you remember, help you have some kind, something to remember about what the message that was said. I mean, it's immaterial what tools we use, but sometimes having those visi visible tools might inspire us to do something different than what we did before. And I want to invite anyone that wants it to have a change of direction or begin to move off their, well, do something different. You know, instead of just sitting still and not doing anything and not working, not looking for a job, not looking for opportunities to gain some assistance, not going to organizations that might help you some kind of way have some shelter, I want to help you. Step right up. I want to help you. And so thank you for, thank you for being here. Because I know most of you are here just out of respect for me. And I appreciate, one of the most important things I appreciate all of you being here is, I am so blessed. I'm so, I don't even know how to express it. I, ne I need what I have here more than probably you need me. Because you're giving me something that is priceless. 
and you're helping me to get this relationship with God that I never could have without you people being around here. So I want to thank each one of you for taking the time, spending your time, listening to me, making some comments. You're touching my heart, each one of you are. When the food arrives, we're going to have communion to commemorate Jesus Christ because the whole purpose of me coming here, the whole thing that motivated me to feed the hungry and the homeless was to feed the Word of God. And so this mission of me given food in the material also is an excuse to give food in the spiritual. And so I see it as my job to give the recognition to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, in remembrance of him, drink his blood and eat his flesh. And so I'd like to do that today. Every couple months I like to be reminded this is about Jesus Christ, not about Buddha, not about uh, uh, the Course of Miracles, not about uh, Jones or any or Mary Baker or anybody else. It's all about Jesus Christ. The Waikiki Beach Outreach Ministry is a non-denominational organization, a church without walls. It's pretty evident we have wall. There's another reason why we want to have communion because I want to share with you a special knowledge that was given to me Wednesday. We've been praying the past week about having God's spirit work in these leadership roles. I went to the city hall and some miracles happened. And I'm going to share that. You know, I'm just praising God. Thank oh. you. I'm just, just acknowledging. Matter of fact, I guess since you guys are the only ones that seem to be interested, otherwise the 80 other people that it's going to come after, after we get in line, they're probably not too interested. But you know, those people that are here first, are the people that I'm remembering, I remember you guys, those people that, that pull the wagon, those people that have cooked a little bit, those people that come to Bible study, those are the first people that God, I'm sure, is going to lead me to ask to put in a leadership role. Because I went to, well, I guess I'll tell that story now. I went to City Hall Wednesday. We had three directors, uh, heads of department, not, not, the, not the bureaucracy, but the guys working for Mufi Hanneman. Three heads of directors and the captain of the chief of police and all I was looking for is stop ticketing the homeless they said they can't do that because the legislator passed laws and until those laws are, are changed they got to do what the law tells them to do the second thing was how about give them some permits so I can use a microphone a permit so I can use the electrical power so we can play some gospel music a permit a permit so we can a permit so we can have Bible study underneath the roof. There's 18, 18 tables underneath that roof over there. And we're lucky to get one or two tables. And on weekends we're begging for one table. And in the holidays, it's almost impossibility. We've served, we've had to serve on these benches. And so I'm looking for a permit to have Bible study and supper in the snack shop. And so I said, get rid of these obstacles, give me a permit, I need a permit saying I'm authorized to do this. Well, I got disappointed and the Parks and Recreation said, oh, we can't give you any special privilege, we can't do this and we can't do that. And I put a big smile on my face, uh -huh. yeah, I've heard this, sounds like bureaucracy. I said, okay, okay. And then one of the other directors said, hey, you know, we've been getting together here for some time before you got into this meeting. And we've been talking about turning over another building to the Waikiki Beach Outreach Ministry, but it's owned by the Department of D Defense. So they got to get, into, they don't own the building, but maybe they can influence the governor. And I said, well, I've never seen this building. They said it's about a 25 minute walk down Montserrat. Well, I said, I've never gone beyond Campbell, so I don't know. But one of them, I had two supporters with me 76-year-old Mary, 
was with me. She gave me a kick every once in a while when I started talking in my natural self. If it wasn't the Spirit of the Lord, Jesus Christ speaking, she kicked me. So she was a blessing to me. And the other guy is a, uh, a, a, an attorney, a real estate attorney, and he said he knew about the place. He said, take it, take it, take it. And so, and so, and so I said, okay, I'll seriously consider it because something's better than nothing. I mean, I believe the Lord is telling me we're going to have a place in the middle of Waikiki. But in the meantime, any place, because I can't cook. I have no refrigerator. I have no stove. And I'm walking miles with this, this uh, wagon and this food uh, six days a week. And it would be nice to be able to have some other op way to operate. And so we told him, okay, we'll consider this. So he, one of the directors went immediately into Mufi Hanneman's office and he, he's, Mufi said, I'm going to talk to the governor right now. Yes. So I want to give, I want to give thanks not to Mufi Hanneman, not to the directors of, that were in that meeting, not to me for sure, not to the supporters that were there, but hey, how you doing? We're just telling the good news about uh, uh, about a building that might be available to us very soon right. in Diamond Head. And I want to give credit right now to Sue Ann, yeah. who's having a baby Woo! soon. Oh, she, yeah, Sue she didn't have anybody to cook the meal today. She didn't have her husband here, so she went to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and she went out and bought yeah. the chicken that we're going to eat today. What a blessing. Again, this isn't about... This isn't about me or this ministry. This is all about Jesus Christ. You see, he can work through a pregnant lady in a miraculous way just so that we can each have something to eat. What a blessing this is. And so that's why we're going to have a communion before we eat to remind us, for those of you that are here that love Jesus Christ, remind us that's what it's all about. And so, as I said, those people that are here as if this building comes true, you know, there's going to be a lot of jobs that are necessary. And there's going to be a space for those people that want to do something. See, that's the message I've been sharing. You know, being, loving your neighbor and being willing to do something. See, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a guy that takes you to the second step. And so if you're willing to do something, like pick up the Bible or do something walking with me, then maybe you'll have a shelter. I've been telling you this since last year. God showed me that we're going to have shelter at the end of 2007, and it looks like it's going to happen before the end of 2007. And so keep praying, though. It's not here. Things can fall apart. But keep praying and keep giving the blessings to Jesus Christ. The grape juice represents Jesus' blood. He used the wine. We're using grape juice. Is it true that the Catholic priests, the reason why they're all drunk no. drunks is because all the leftover wine they had to drink? I don't know. I'm not a Catholic, so... That's what I heard. Paul said the order in the Last Supper. He said a lot of people used to get drunk whenever they had the Last Supper and get and drink, eat it excessively. All right. And so he said, but in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if you're more, you, if more harm then good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be division among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat with your own meal without sharing it with others. You know, that's not why I'm here. I share my supper every day what I, what I serve you is what I eat. Amen. I tell the police, I'm just serving my leftovers. It just happens to be, I got 80 people, I make enough for 80 people. That's <laughs> all of the leftovers. Amen. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Right. Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church with shame and honor? What I am supposed to, to say, what am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself. On, that, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. Thank you, Lord, for the bread that you've given us. May it bless us and nourish us in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Do this in remembrance of me. That's a representation of the Spirit of the Lord in your body is becoming, possessing you. His Spirit is possessing you by eating that flesh. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after the supper. This cup is the new covenant, which is uh, the new laws between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as, on, as often as you drink it. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that his blood, that he paid the price for our sins, may all of our sins be washed in his blood, and that his spirit within this blood come through us to cleanse our whole body in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And just a remembrance for the next time we do this. So anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. I know you're worship. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup yourself, without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to be dropped upon each and every one of us. When Jesus was walking on this earth, he said, I can only have touch those people that are around me. Just like as I'm walking on this earth, I can only touch those people that come around me. So he ascended into heaven to give us the, his comforter, to allow his spirit to come into each of our lives. And if you see anything that's good coming out of me, it is not Bob or Earth. I believe it's Jesus Christ. So don't praise me for anything that you see me doing. I believe it's Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus Christ wanted me to share his blood and his flesh at this moment in time. And would one of you like to say a prayer? Sue Ann? Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity together and to partake in the communion. We want to give thanks to you for everything in our lives. We pray for um, uh, Holy Spirit to be upon us, that we will walk right before you and we will do the right things, Lord. And we have. Give us the faith, Lord, to believe that, as you said, in all things you will work for the good of those who love you. So we thank you for this time and um, may we pray for peace and joy in our hearts as we come together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 See us bouncing off the clouds.